Hey everybody, Dr. Tamara here coming to you sweaty live from my post gym session. I hope you guys have had a really good Wednesday. Do you know what? I just want to start by let's just get rid of some energy. Like I have been to the gym tonight and seriously punched out some uh, some negative emotions today on the boxing bag and, and with my PT. So I feel like I've gotten a lot of energy out. So if you have had one of those days today, I want you to drop it right here. Sisters and brothers, let's drop it in the chat. If you've had some negative energy today, let's just let it all out, right? Let's just share, share it because negative energy shared is negative energy hard. And if you've had an awesome day, then drop that in the chat too because positive energy shared is positive energy doubled. So we're at hump day today and tonight I want to share with you. Oh, look at all my friends jumping on. Hi guys. So good to see you. Thank you so much. Say hi. Tell us where you're coming from. Share the love, share the angst, whatever it's been today. But emotion shared is definitely helpful. Tonight I want to talk to you about um, real, some really cool questions were asked um, over the last couple of days. I haven't gotten to them all because I know that there were some that went up this afternoon, but I've got about six or seven that I want to talk about. Emotion of the day, cranky and sad, own it sister, it's okay. <laughs> I know that cranky sadness. Rabia, you had a good day, yay yay, fantastic, that's awesome. Hey Jesse, shocking day. Oh, endo flare. That's terrible. I'm so sorry about that. That's really hard to deal with. So share it here, guys, because when you share it with your sisterhood and your brotherhood, then it just helps it so makes it so much easier to deal with. Shocking day. Sorry to hear that. So let's move on, shall we? On the couch for Wednesday night. Now, somebody did drop a question um, a little earlier on about fibroids and submucosal fibroids and their impact on miscarriage and fertility. Um, I did talk about that. I don't think it was last Wednesday. I think it was the Wednesday before. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that you go back and have a listen to that. But the long and the short of it is that if you have submucosal fibroids, fibroids that are impacting on the cavity that have been shown on an ultrasound to distort the cavity um, in some way, then there is definitely a possibility that they can affect miscarriage rates and they can be treated. So I would suggest you get yourself along to a gynecologist who does endoscopic surgery, who can manage that for you. Even better, somebody who works in the world of fertility who can uh, manage those to improve your chances of conception. Okay, so hopefully that's answered that, but definitely go back and have a listen to my previous uh, Q&A on fibroids. Now, some cool questions today. Thank you so much. Christine, super busy, felt powerful. I love that, own it. Love that feeling of empowerment. All right, in your experience of transferring a mosaic embryo, how successful has it been resulting in a pregnancy, a term pregnancy, a healthy term baby? Wow, heavy stuff. So um, let's just address what mosaicism is because a lot of people are like, what? <laughs> so every cell in the human body has a karyotype, right? And so if you're a female, your karyotype is 46XX. If you're a male, your karyotype is 46XY. So 46 chromosomes, um, including your um, X and your Y and your X and your X. Now, that's presuming that every single cell in your body is exactly the same. And sometimes we can take cells from an early embryo and we can actually see that there are more than one cell line. So there are some cells that are, say, 46XX, for example, and there might be some cell lines that are, show there's an extra chromosome 21 or an extra chromosome 2 or not enough of chromosome 15, for example. But because the majority of the cell line is a normal karyotype, it might be that that embryo continues to grow on and create a healthy pregnancy. But it's a mosaic embryo. It's made up of different cell lines. So that might be confusing to start with, but a mosaic embryo is neither normal nor is it abnormal. It's, it's somewhere in between. And we're really only just discovering, uh, now that we have such advanced technology in the world of genetic testing, that we were really only just discovering the presence of these mosaic embryos. Have they always been there? Absolutely. 
we've just never been able to recognize it. So have we transferred mosaic embryos before? Absolutely. <laughs> we just never knew that they were mosaic. So what we have come to learn, and again, this is a burgeoning area. This is an area of much controversy, much discussion. But the long and the short of it is we have determined that if you do genetic testing, and the genetic testing is where you grow an embryo out to about day five when there's about 100 cells and you make a little hole in the shell, the zona pellucida, and you take out somewhere between five and 10 cells from that trophectoderm, that trophoblastic tissue, and then you freeze that embryo and that tissue is sent off to a lab and they grow up those cells and they analyze the number of chromosomes and they can tell us, oh, in this small sample, there is the suggestion of mosaicism multiple cell lines. So we can actually know that information now on an embryo. Now, there is a lot of controversy around that testing and I don't really wanna go into that now, but what we have determined that if you have a mosaic embryo and you put it back, you transfer it, there is a much higher likelihood that it will not take, you will not conceive, and a much higher likelihood that you will miscarry than if you transferred a euploid or normal, I say that in inverted commas because what's normal, a normal um, embry tested embryo, right? So there's a higher chance of miscarriage, lower chance of implantation and uh, creating a pregnancy. But if it implants and it is an ongoing pregnancy, the chances of having a normal term live birth is high. In fact, in the data published pretty close to now, like up-to-date data, there have not been any known children born with any specific syndromes from a known mosaic embryo transfer. And so that's where we sit with the data. Now, the International Guideline Group on Pre-Implantation Genetic Testing has some guidelines around which mosaic embryos we should transfer, we can transfer, and which we probably shouldn't. And so if you're in that situation and you've got a mosaic embryo, I would strongly suggest that you have the opportunity to talk to a genetic counselor or a geneticist about the suitability of transferring a mosaic embryo that you have. And so I think that probably rounds out that question as best as I can answer it. Someone has asked about ovulation pain. We call it Mittelschmerz. That's the German word for ovulation pain. Why is ovulation so painful? Can endometriosis cause painful information? Yeah, painful ovulation. Um, okay, so when you ovulate, you actually erode a little hole in the follicle and li that literally ruptures and allows the uh, egg surrounded by its cumulus cells to literally pop out. For some people, not everybody, but for some people, the sensation of ovulation is something they can feel. Um, I'm not one of them, <laughs> so I can't really describe what that is. But I have many patients who have Mittelschmerz, which is the sensation of feeling physiological ovulation, completely normal. It's just you feel it. Um, is that necessarily painful? Mm, not if it's pathological, perhaps. And so if someone has endometriosis, they perhaps have some an endometrioma on their ovary, maybe their ovary is encased in adhesions, and that physiological process of popping out that egg, maybe it gets stuck in the tissue, maybe the fluid from, from the ovulation process is encapsulated in adhesions, that can be really painful. And so painful ovulation, if someone describes to me, I have painful ovulation every single month and requiring pain relief, I will probably move forward with some form of investigation. But can people just physiologically feel ovulation? Absolutely, and that's called Mittelschmerz. What are my thoughts on seeing a naturopath when trying to conceive? I think it's a great idea. I think if you are needing assistance with the basics around lifestyle, um, and, and, and optimizing the temple, um, whether it be a him or a her, because let's face it, fertility is about two people, right? And as I've said before, the health of a sperm uh, is, is 
is the best barometer for a bloke's health. So if you are needing help with that kind of um, stuff, then I think seeing a naturopath who has a large amount of experience with fertility, perhaps a fertility naturopath who works in association with um, evidence you know based mainstream medicine so there is a nice balance between the two and a recognition that okay I've done as much as I can it's now time for you to to move on perhaps to um, the medical model I think that it's really valuable one of the greatest thing I know about the amazing naturopaths that I work with is the incredible amount of time that they spend with their patients like one and two hours really getting down into the deep and dirty about what it is that you do in your day-to-day -day life and what it is that you can potentially change. I think that's amazing that they do that. So um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a fantastic inclusion as part of your holistic care and particularly um, being choosy about the naturopath that you see. Someone would like to know, actually, there's two questions I'm going to try and com combine in one. Oh, can I suggest any naturopaths? Oh, gosh. I work with um, Perth Health and Fertility, um, Anna Sangster and Lisa Murdoch. They're fantastic. I've done some great work with them in the past. Um, okay. Uh, let's, talk about, uh, let's talk about polycystic ovarian syndrome and some of the management options. So someone has asked a question about the role of metformin. Um, in PCOS when trying to conceive. Um, also the role of metformin in an IVF cycle in someone who um, might have PCOS and therefore in pregnancy. And then someone else has asked a question on how to fix insulin resistance um, to help fix the menstrual cycle and therefore help with falling pregnant. Okay, so I'm gonna try and answer all of those. I may go off track. I'll try really hard not to. Um, okay, so metformin is a diabetic drug, right? It is an insulin sensitizer. In fact, insulin does a number of different things. I'm not going to go into the, to the pharmacology of it today, but um, it is used in the, in the context of polycystic ovarian syndrome when trying to conceive the evidence shows us that in someone who has a, a, a BMI below 30, so someone who has already addressed, in fact, let me take this back a sec. 40% of women who have uh, PCOS have a degree, have metabolic syndrome, which is often a degree of insulin resistance. In fact, if you take a history from them, they've often got a family history of diabetes or PCOS. So there's a lot of genetics in this as well, combined with lifestyle. And I know that a lot of women with PCOS find it very difficult to lose weight. Um, they'll often have um, high cholesterol, sometimes blood pressure issues, and they'll have insulin resistance. What that means is that... Um, the even if they are working really hard to keep their blood sugars low through managing sugar intake and also doing physical active activity their insulin just sits a little bit high their insulin resistance so the first line management of insulin resistance is drum roll lifestyle <laughs> that's the first line so if, if someone with pcos comes to me and they've got irregular cycles the very first thing i'm going to ask about is have you addressed the dietary stuff? Have you addressed the lifestyle stuff? Have you addressed the exercise? Now, if they've been well managed with their PCOS, they will already know this. So if, if you're someone with PCOS and you have like, this is news to me, get stuck into your lifestyle stuff. So really perhaps sit with a good dietitian to talk about what is the right kinds of food to be eating. Make sure you're doing regular exercise throughout your week um, and really watching your weight. Um, awesome, Beck, getting a PCOS test this week. Well done. Um, oh, I'm glad that, yeah, it is a really good question on PCOS and, and metformin. So anyway, I digress. So a certain amount of women will have already addressed the lifestyle stuff and yet their periods are still really irregular. And when we do blood tests and we look into their metabolic status, even though they're doing as best as they can with their lifestyle, their insulin is still raised. They still have a degree of insulin resistance. We know that higher insulin will drive androgens the male hormone, 
and that male hormone will then drive the irregular cycles. So in order for us to reduce the androgens, we reduce the insulin. How do we reduce the insulin? Metformin. So metformin is really well placed in someone who has optimized their lifestyle as much as they can. And then we bring metformin in to help further reduce their insulin resistance to help to regulate their cycles. And hopefully, hopefully they fall spontaneously pregnant. If not, metformin has been proven or shown to be a good adjuvant sideline to ovulation induction treatment. In fact, the pregnancy rates are better if you do ovulation in induction with metformin alongside that. Now, let's say you're a woman who actually has PCOS and for some reason, maybe you've got blocked tubes, maybe it's your husband's sperm, you need to go through IVF. You see, we know IVF is not the treatment for PCOS unless there's some other factor. So let's say you're someone who has PCOS and you're going through IVF. Metformin is introduced in that situation to reduce the chances of you developing ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which occurs in about 1% of women and has a much higher risk of occurring if you have PCOS because you've got bucket loads of eggs. So we've got to be really careful not to overstimulate you too much. And metformin will help to reduce the chances of you developing ovarian hyperstimulation in your IVF cycle. So that's the role there. Um, and in pregnancy, well, often if we've had you on metformin in fertility treatment, we will encourage you to stay on that in the early stages of pregnancy to keep that insulin resistance down to improve that whole metabolic environment of the uterus while that placenta is, is really embedding itself. And that really should continue through until the early second trimester. Beyond that point in time, it is entirely up to your obstetrician as to whether or not they continue that or they take you off it and later on in the pregnancy do an oral glucose tolerance test because as you no doubt know, or if you don't, now you do, that about um, two thirds of women who have PCOS will go on to develop gestational diabetes in pregnancy. No matter how hard you work, it's just part of the metabolic syndrome and the hormones that that placenta is developing. So I'm hoping that kind of answered that question. Now onto the second one, someone asked that question about insulin re resistance. So I'm hoping that round the corner you understand that if you help to reduce your weight by reducing the sugar intake and increasing the exercise and bringing therefore that insulin resistance down that lower um, insulin, that, that reduction in insulin resistance is going to help the ovulatory cycle, which is therefore going to help you conceive. So for particularly people, women with PCOS, that weight management is key. Now, most of you will know that there's always a pendulum that can swing the other way and we don't want you to overdo it. There are situations too where, you know, women will over exercise um, and, oh, Cassie, great question. I'm going to come back to it. Um, women will over-exercise and therefore completely shut off their hypothalamic pituitary axis. And I have had women with PCOS who have completely pendulum the other way. So, you know, you don't need to be doing five to 10 CrossFit classes a week um, to manage your insulin resistance. Just some gentle, moderate level exercise three to four times per week, working on the dietary aspect of it as well. Um, to help really reduce that insulin resistance. Cassie just asked a great question, but you heard that metformin was for overweight women. Awesome question. In fact, if you have a woman who has already worked on the lifestyle stuff and they might still be a little overweight and their insulin is showing that it's elevated, then the metformin can further help to reduce their insulin resistance. So in all honesty, Anyone who has PCOS who comes in to my care is most likely to met, get metformin whether they are overweight or whether they are of normal weight because even though it's being used in two slightly different ways, the outcome is still the same. The other good thing about metformin, and this is really only if you're overweight, <laughs> is that there's somewhere between a two and five kilogram weight loss that is uh, associated with taking it. 
Be mindful though, it can give you a little bit of gut upset, so you have gotta be really careful of the food that you're consuming when you're taking metformin. So slow introduction, don't go hammer and tongs straight away. Slow in introduction of metformin over a couple of weeks and, and you should get over those gut feelings. No problems. Okay, someone asked about lipidol flushing. Oh, I love this topic. I was a really big fan of lipidol flushing about um, 18 months to two years ago. And there is a beautiful study that was done by an amazing fertility doctor, Dr. Ben Mole, who now is in Adelaide, um, done over a number of different institutions, so a really good quality study. And it showed that in a group of couples who have unexplained infertility, so we've done all the tests, we can't figure out why they're not falling pregnant, and they are a younger age group, so sort of average age 32 to 34, doing a lipidol flush, they have an increased chance of spontaneous pregnancy over the next six months. Beyond six months, their pregnancy rates are no different. We don't really know why. We don't know if it's like flushing the gunk out of the tubes, or is it maybe that the lipidol has this kind of immunomodulating effect on the peritoneum? Maybe there's a little bit of endo in there, and maybe the lipidol, um, which is a soybean extract, actually uh, kind of modulates the immune environment within the pelvis, and then they fall spontaneously pregnant. We don't really know why. The only thing that I will say with caution with lipidol is that it's come to light that women who have a lipidol flush do get some um, irregularities to their iodine levels and thyroid function in the ensuing six months. So they really should have their thyroid function monitored for six months following having lipidol flushing. So I'm a little less keen to use it than I was two years ago. Um, I will be very selective in the patients who I offer it to. Um, I really think it's only de that defined group um, where the woman is in that early 30 age group where I would consider offering lipidol flushing. Um, okay, last question, and I love this one because this is a really common one for all of us. You read lots of stuff on the internet. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's hard to separate out the trash from the treasure, right? Um, what a... And, and there's some crazy stuff to improve fertilization. Is there anything you can do to suggest to do immediately after intercourse, like lying down or raising your legs? Does any of this make a difference? No. <laughs> That's the simple answer. It doesn't really make a difference. We know that sperm can be found in the cervical mucus within seconds. It does take on average about 20 minutes to this, for the semen to completely liquefy. So it's not completely unreasonable if you lay there for 10 to 15 minutes while that semen is just liquefying to allow all of the sperm to be able to swim out. Because gravity, as you know, will probably drop that um, pellet of semen to the lower part of the vagina. It just means the sperm have a lot longer to go. So it seems reasonable, doesn't it, really, to just wait that 10 to 15 minutes. <laughs> but the reality is we know we can find sperm in the cervical mucus within seconds um, if, uh, if, the, if the pellet of semen kind of makes it to the top of the vagina. Um, raising your legs, changing position. Someone asked about eating different types of food to help us choose gender. None of that stuff works, guys. <laughs> Regular timed intercourse or using some form of ovulation testing like an ovulation kit, um, if you can, uh, is probably the best way. And then timing intercourse um, around the time of ovulation, which happens somewhere between 12 and 24 hours after you get that LH surge. Uh, very quickly, Kristen's answer, this is just because I've seen it flash by. Can you have regular periods with PCOS? Yeah, you can, Kristen. You can manage PCOS really, really well. Um, what you've got to ensure is that the periods represent ovulation, okay? So I would always recommend that you get a, a mid-luteal progesterone, so progesterone level done um, um, after you think you've ovulated to make sure that um, these periods that you're registering actually are associated with, with ovulation because there can be situations where you're having a regular period but you're not actually ovulating every month. So I'd make sure you get that. Some people call it a day 21 progesterone, but that's really only if you're ovulating, sorry, if your cycle's 28 days. Not everyone has a 28 day cycle. So um, about a week before your period is due-ish is a good time to get your progesterone tested. Well, you know what, guys? I'm, I'm tuckered out. <laughs> that was a big session. There was some awesome stuff in there. 
Over the month of March, I am going to be a little bit more specific with my Q and A's. You're gonna see on a Sunday night, we're gonna have a little bit of a theme come through with different Q's and A's. So keep an eye out for our little request for Q and A so that you can um, send us through some more specific topic questions so that we can try and condense everything. But I'm loving this. Thank you so, so, so much for all of these amazing questions that you are sending through. It's, um, it's been really valuable and I'm glad that it's been really valuable for you. What I will remind everybody is that everything that I talk about is here in here is really generic. It is not pertaining to any one person's situation. If you have further questions about what you are going through, then please don't hesitate to go and see your fertility specialist, your GP, your doctor, your naturopath, your endocrinologist, whomever, to get your specific questions answered. And I do want to give a shout out tonight to Cassie Silver, who I know is on here tonight, whose podcast is launched today, what to expect when you're injecting. Uh, we had an, a fantastic chat um, a couple of days ago, and I am so excited for her vision and um, I would definitely keep an eye out for that podcast on all of the different streaming channels. Uh, guys, have a beautiful rest of your week. I'm hoping that you got out all of those emotions. Share them here. If they're negative, remember a negative emotion shared is halved. A positive emotion is doubled. So share them here. And I can't wait to see you next week for Q&A. Have a beautiful week. See you soon.